Welcome to the Navigating the Noise podcast. First-hand stories and winning ideas from marketing department leaders. And now, here's your host, Jerry Alaka. Welcome to the Navigating the Noise podcast, brought to you by Connected Culture, a digital marketing agency obsessed with conversions. I'm your host, Cherry Alaka, and this is the first and only podcast to put the spotlight on the unsung heroes of the marketing department as we navigate the noise of modern marketing. Joining me today is Anthony Sarchapone, who's going to tell us all about education marketing. Anthony, welcome to the show. Thank you, Jerry. Thanks for having me. Anthony, tell us a little about yourself. Uh, so I'm I'm a marketing uh, professional. I uh, started out in uh, copywriting. I started out in creative. I've worked in publishing and education, um, in the publishing and education industry for the past 20 years, um, moving from creative through up through uh, marketing, uh, moving from, you know, just like a lot of us through print, marketing into digital, um, into email, into automation. As what I've noticed is uh, going from department to department over the course of many years, um, like everybody knows, right? Departments are getting smaller. Um, departments are, should be more efficient. So they've gotten more efficient. You know, I think anybody who's been in the business for a while knows that, you know, uh, can talk about creative departments that had, you know, 20 people in them and copyrighted copywriters that, you know, we had six copywriters, we had 12 designers, you know, we had mar junior marketing managers, marketing managers, senior marketing managers, marketing directors. So departments, you know, the trend, of course, like everybody knows, is things get smaller, things get more efficient, and techno marketing technology has helped it help departments become more efficient. As a marketing department of one, mm -hmm. obviously that's that's very difficult, to, a lot of challenges there, but is it really easier to have a lot more people uh, to work with in a marketing department? Yes, it's easier to be part of a team, definitely. So to be a marketing department of one, even when you have uh, vendors and experts helping you, I my experience is it's just, that's more challenging than having a small team. I think most efficient is when you have a small team and people who specialize in a couple of key areas like social media, like digital marketing. Um, if you have specialists in areas that really do require specialists because you want a significant outcome from that channel or you want that channel to contribute to conversions, to marketing qualified leads, to sales in a significant way, then it's best to have a small department with a couple of key specialists. Um, and then, you know, vendors who come in or outside talent that comes in from your network, people you trust who are designers, for example, writers, long form writers, videographers. That's always great to be working with people outside of the organization um, who you can bring in and work with on a project by project basis. That takes a lot of the pressure off of having an expensive marketing department carrying a lot of headcount. If you have a department that can say, hey, here's, here are, here, let's keep serving up marketing qualified leads. Let's keep the pipeline going and the pipeline full. And each day and each week and each month serving up marketing qualified leads. So then sales can say, hey, these are, we're able to convert really well out of this channel or that channel uh, or this campaign or that campaign. Then you can really get a nice um, sales and marketing engine going. Uh, without that automation, without that link between uh, whether, you know, between your automation platform and your CRM, that's where things can stall and break down and, and eat up time. So that's why I think that's critical. Everybody's always looking at that bottom line, you know. Um, so we want to make sure that those marketing qualified leads really are converting. So as your marketing department starts growing and, and you have more and more people, you obviously have now more and more communications. And there are tools like Slack that promise to reduce the amount of emails that you'll get internally. So have you used tools like this? And, and what's been your experience with, uh, with tools like yeah. Slack? I've used Slack. Slack was, Slack was great. I'm a real Slack convert. We, we were using it um, recently in a past job and I thought it was terrific. Uh, everybody was on board. It was really pushed by management to use it. Um, the great thing about Slack is you can create 
So the, some of the big positives about Slack is you get quick answers, just like text, right? It's um, if, if we're going through email and the email starts backing up, people get to their emails maybe at the end of the day after a meeting. Um, but if we're communicating on Slack, you can get some simple questions answered quickly. Uh, you can put those Slack groups together and get three or four people who are working on a project to um, kind of help you move things along when you have questions in the middle of a campaign or whatever it is that you're trying to put together for the product for the uh, product marketing team or for the sales team. Um, the nice thing about Slack, it has an integration with HubSpot. Uh, what I found useful was I could do a deployment. Um, we could do a deployment and then share it to a Slack channel that we created. And the metrics for that um, email deployment would show up in Slack. So uh, yeah, I thought it was great. Reduce the number of emails and really, I think also reduce the number of uh, meetings that we needed to have uh, because we could kind of get discussions going and get projects going through Slack. So by the time we met on a weekly basis or you're meeting in one-on-ones, like a lot of uh, work has already been done. So yeah, Slack, I, I would recommend it definitely. With Slack, do you find yourself responding quicker to uh, Slack chats or to email? Uh, definitely, <clears throat> definitely responding quicker to Slack. It becomes a little bit like, you know, like a text message. You know, you might take an hour or two to respond to an email um, because you have to compose it or you're asking for more information. But on Slack, uh, like text, they're easy. You answer quickly. I'll, you get, might get an answer in five or 10 minutes or some, as soon as somebody's out of a meeting. Um, you can, all the good stuff from email, you know, you can pop an attachment in there. You can link over to Google Drive, things like that. So uh, I find, and we found that we got faster answers through Slack and that just helped things move along. Cause like you have simple questions that need to be answered um, like a discount, you know, 10% versus 15, you know, what did, uh, what did we decide on 10% or 15%? And what did we decide on? Is this gonna run to the end of the month or is it just a seven day promotion? Um, and is it going to that list of 5,000 or that list of 15,000? So things like that, uh, quick answers like that can help projects just kind of get done um, within the hour versus maybe end of day or suddenly you're into the next day because you're still waiting on um, little questions like that. As your marketing department is growing and the need for efficiency is greater and greater, you're introducing tools like Slack. So what does it mean to have a fully functional marketing department? If we follow the business and say, how can we, what do we need in terms of a marketing function or a marketing department? to move into those other channels or move into those other functions where we can convert more to the next, convert to the next stage or convert to the next, get those people to the next step in their journey. That's how you start to, fr I think, start to hit frame out what a fully functional marketing department could be. It's taking advantage or making sure you have the expertise to convert channels that are um, setting themselves up to be um, promising for uh, revenue generation. That when we talk about function, what what are we talking about when we say a functional marketing department? We're functioning to convert, and we're functioning to convert leads that convert to sales. So it sounds like the the relationship between the marketing department and the sales department is a, a critical one. Do you bring them in in the very beginning when you're starting your marketing plan and and putting you know putting the plans together? Yes, because they've got their ear to the ground. You know, they know. What are your customers looking for? You're right. What problems are, are are they facing this year? You know, what are they trying to solve? You know, we make assumptions about what our customers want based on maybe last year or the previous year or 10 years ago. So always looping in the sales team um, at the beginning of a campaign or the beginning of the marketing plan and then continuously talking to them every week. Um, I've had one on, you know, one on ones with sales teams every week, every month. Um, I think it helps a lot because then then there's not a disconnect. Then the, the value chain is like linking up. Would you say sales is a great source of information when you're developing personas? And maybe tell us a, a little about personas. When we did persona development, um, we really asked like, how do you, who, who do you talk to when you make a decision? Who helps you make a decision? What channels are you in? What do you consult? Um, and in speaking to faculty and librarians and people who are in the education space, um, and are responsible for other people. We found that, you know, and this might not be different again from other industries, you know, that peer to peer, um, peer to peer interaction was how they made decisions. You have extensive experience in education marketing. 
and COVID, let's face it, it's changed a lot of different businesses, but education, you know, whether it's K through 12 or higher ed or just different, uh, you know, training or uh, educational companies, what do you see as the most critical things that they have to address today to get through uh, this, this pandemic? They really have to retool or reckon with that all the engagement with their customers and with their prospects is all happening through the online channels. If you were in a marketing department that really never didn't get its act together with respect to social media or didn't get its act together with respect to um, email marketing or marketing automation or your website and your SEO was, you know, you're always kicking that can down the road in terms of fixing things or improving things or keywords, you know, do we have the right keywords and has our website been kind of cobbled together from past websites and things like that? All of those things need to be addressed right away. People learn from mistakes. What have you seen from others that you would consider mistakes to avoid? I tell my own mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> if we're limited in terms of the information we have, that already puts us in a challenging position. And if we, we talked before about a fully functional marketing department, if we can't get to the analytics or the analytics isn't functioning properly on a site or isn't feeding into one place where we can kind of put everything together and make a, a decision based on data and an actionable decision, then, um, then we're always sort of like, always kind of repeating the same uh, mistake. And I think it becomes a mistake of not being as efficient as we wanna be. So starting a marketing campaign without a proper persona or audience profiles, would you say that's one of the biggest mistakes to avoid? When we first started doing personas, you know, you say like, okay, well, yeah, it's like, well, what is, it's not, you know, and anybody who's done them understands it goes beyond like, not just what is the customer, has the customer purchased and what do they want, but really understanding, like I, I said before, in terms of edu educators and healthcare workers and information people, people work with children, people work with patients, people work with students. It's understanding, drilling down to like, you know, these are compassionate people or these are caregivers. And then starting to formulate your language from there. I know from a copywriter perspective, it says we're going to use this kind of, we're going to use words like nurture and give. So understanding their worldview and using language that aligns to that um, is how you can say like, you know, then we're speaking to them. If we're speaking to them and earning their trust, then we can genuinely help them uh, move forward um, in what they want to do. So yes, I think that's a constraint. I think it's a, a mistake in that it's just the, kind of the way business sometimes moves too fast or we're not, maybe not, if we're not allocating our resources appropriately, we have those resources, then we need to put them in that place. If we need to, we need to educate the businesses that we work for that, you know what this, it, it's theory, but it really does, it really will work out in the end to provide better conversions for us. And then we have to demonstrate that. Then, then there's the challenge on top of that. We have to demonstrate that that's helping conversions, um, whatever those might be. You talked about a few ways that you can build your persona, learn more about uh, your target audience. We talked about the salesperson. Uh, talk to any salesperson or anybody who touches the customer or is in conversations with the customer. That's a great resource. We've talked about, um, you know, maybe it's the CEO or maybe it's uh, customer service. Maybe it's online. You can research some forums, discussions, and groups and, and learn what conversations these people are having. First of all, talk to the customers, Give, you know, absolutely. So always checking in with customers, always doing some kind of focus group if you can. Uh, again, and again, you might not have the resources or the time to do it, but if you do have the resources and the time to do it, or you can make a case for the resources and the time to do it, um, checking in every year with people is a great idea. It goes a long way. I know when we did our persona development, we talked to, I don't know how many customers, I mean, in the end, by the time we got to the people who would talk to us, I mean, you're talking about maybe 10 or 20 people would talk to us or 15 people is a small number, but the insights were cons were consistent and you saw affirmation through a couple of customers and it, it gave you enough of a basis to kind of uh, work from. So that's important. I know um, what I find you know, I go on to Facebook through the messenger, you know, I look at Facebook messenger, I'll look at the chat that's going on on our Facebook pages and see what customer people are talking about, what they're sharing, what they find, um, you know, what they like about what we're posting, what they don't like, but what they're saying to other 
in the, in, you know, whether it's other parents or other students or, or educators, what they're talking about and saying to each other. I think that's where you get also get a lot of insight. You have to bring, you know, anybody who's in, you know, an analyst, it's not just reporting the number. It's like, it's the insight that's going to come for it, from it. And for us, it's the insight that we're going to deliver to the company that we're with, the people we work with, uh, but the insight that we're going to translate, the insight that we're going to get to the customer, him or herself, about what he or she wants. And that insight is going to change your marketing for the better. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. What's your advice for a marketing professional just walking into a brand new marketing department? Well, uh, I think anybody walking in for the first time into a marketing department is going to right away, you're going to see how the previous people um, or the ran the marketing department or how the company runs the marketing department. So um, some things will be working really well and other things, again, because of constraints, lack of time, everybody trying to do the best that they can do or, you know, some things aren't functioning the way optimally, the way you want them function. So uh, number one, um, uh, but email is a kind of email is a little bit my go-to thing. Like I would, I would do due diligence on an email list just to ask the question. If you're looking at uh, if it's a small company and they have uh, a client list or an email list of 150,000, I would, I would ask like, Hey, how did we acquire, you know, so just like, how did we acquire all these names? I would start to ask questions a little bit on the quality of their email list. Cause you might find that, Years ago, somebody rented a list or purchased a list and put it in. I mean, of course, look at the metrics. If the metrics aren't very good, of course, it's that could be an indicator of how with the quality of the list. The second thing would be um, it, it, with respect to uh, uh, social media accounts. Uh, you might find that they are all connected to the personal uh, accounts of the previous or the previous previous or the previous 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 marketing manager or CEO or COO or somebody like that. So it's to make sure that um, when a person leaves that uh, your Facebook and your other social media isn't just linked up to their personal email account. And now you're having to kind of go back to them to make changes. So that's something that sometimes pops up. Uh, the other is uh, with respect to the website. So if you have a web development team, that's great. But if there is no web development team or there's no IT team, really understanding how the site was built up over years. Um, maybe it's a new site, right? And they just did everything last year and everything's cool. But maybe it's a site that's been around for a while and has had a, a number of different vendors or companies working on it. So uh, really understanding how well is their SEO working uh, taking the time to dig into the SEO and dig into the back end, especially the technical SEO, and making sure that pages uh, pages that are telling Google they're one thing are not something else. Uh, I worked at a place where um, the pay, the metadata said it was a blog, and it wasn't a blog. It was all product information about something else. So um, really uh, taking the time to make sure all that SEO is in place and the site, you know, how did the site come to be and how well is the site working? So naturally it's looking at analytics right away and seeing if you can troubleshoot, um, you know, does everything look right to you? Like are people bouncing like, bent, like crazy off of pages? What does the behavior look like? If you know how to go into Google analytics and look at the behaviors, people come into the site, where are they coming in and where are they going? You know, back to social media, paid social media, are there, you know, look at those, look at those ad accounts and see if somebody a long time ago set up, um, set up an ad account and they're spending $2,000 a month and it's running in perpetuity um, and it hasn't been turned off. Um, are there more than one accounts uh, that are sending people to your pages? Is there an official account? And then somebody sent up, set up kind of like a personal non-official account. Um, so I would look at that. Um, and that sometimes means going to the finance department and asking them, saying, hey, are we getting invoices from Facebook or Pinterest or whomever and or YouTube and are they coming every month? Do we know what they are? So that's something to look at. Um, and finally, I would say um, with respect to brand and logos, um, you know, and I think everybody deals with this, you know, are we using who's got the official logo files and where are the official logo files? And again, if you have a creative department that could all be perfectly in order, um, but has the, you know, are we using different fonts and sizes and, 
and the Pantone, is it the right color? Is it just slightly off? Did we slightly change it? Did somebody two years ago for a very brief period of time change things up? And then that's kind of worked its way into your branding and it keeps popping up in odd places. So I would also kind of look at that, get a hold of the official logo. And um, one thing uh, that one thing to do is kind of put together that marketing toolkit so everybody has everything in one place. Um, and everybody's working off of the same materials. Um, that's uh, off the top of my head. That's pretty much it. Now you mentioned email. Isn't it amazing how people hate spam, hate yep. spam. Yep. And yet when it's your product in your company or your service, all of a sudden you start asking yourself or asking other marketers, Hey, how do we rent an email list and he's like, well, how do, you mean how spam, do, right? How do you spam other people? Don't do that. Just, right. just don't. <laughs> <laughs> if you're sending people stuff that they didn't ask for and you're sending them transactional emails, that's spam. And then that hurts your sender reputation. And um, people in the marketing department understand that, but uh, people in the rest of the business might not understand sender reputation, might not understand how you're blocked um, at the IP level or blacklisted. Another thing is to check if you if you are being blacklisted. I mean, you'll know that right away by looking at your email metrics. But um, if the metrics look oddly low um, and bad, you know, um, check it, check if you're being blocked somewhere. Um, and there's companies like Return Path uh, that can be useful for that. And there's a tool from Google. We'll, we'll put it in the show notes that will tell you if you've been blacklisted on Gmail. Oh, great! Yeah, excellent. Anthony, thanks so much for being on the show and sharing your insights with other marketing department leaders. Thank you, Jerry. Thanks for having me. Thanks so much for checking out Navigating the Noise podcast. Subscribe today by clicking the subscribe button or visit navigatingthenoise.com to subscribe via email. On our website, you can access the show notes, resources, and links from today's episode to help you take action on what was discussed. Also, you can ask Jerry questions that he may reply to on the show. Plus, if you're a leader in your marketing department and would like to be a guest, you can contact us through the site. It's really easy. Just visit navigatingthenoise.com to subscribe, watch episodes, ask Jerry anything, or to be a guest. Until next time, stay safe, navigate wisely.